This book begins with Elijah being taken up in a whirlwind and concludes with the kingdom of Judah under siege by Babylon. In between, the northern tribes of Israel go into Assyrian captivity, and so we discover that this book is a record of steep decline with only a few bright spots. Here are some positive events from 2 Kings. The southern kingdom of Judah did enjoy the periodic leadership of good kings, such as Hezekiah, Josiah, and Uzziah. These were men who exhibited godly leadership during dark times in Israel's history. But sadly, men like these were the exception. Tonight, we're in the book of 2 Kings. And uh, if it seems like I talk fast on Wednesday night, it's because we're going to cover the whole book of 2 Kings tonight, like we did 1 Kings last week. So to cover that kind of material requires a fast-talking pilot. And I'm that pilot. I'll talk rapid tonight. And it is a flyover, just so you understand the general gist of this. We have been through the Bible, and 2 Kings included, in depth, verse by verse, and it's on CD, and it's on tape, and it's archived, and you can pull it down and listen to it. But this is flying over, and just like when a pilot reaches cruising altitude and says, and if you look to your left, you see the Grand Canyon, and if you look to your right, that kind of stuff, we'll be noticing certain things, summing up a great deal, and getting the gist, because what we're trying to do in the next several months in finishing this up, by God's grace, is showing how it all fits together. Well, I noticed by reading USA Today today that last night, American Idol started. Well, I've always been intrigued by that title, by the way. It's sort of a very honest title, an honest admission, American idolatry. But um, <laughs> as it was the opening program last night, and, and the opening program is the one where they they highlight all the rejects, and yet it is like one of their most highly rated programs. It's interesting. The article read, and here's the title, Idol Starts Out Bad and Fans Love It. And here's a sentence from it, a couple of them. TV shows usually don't boast about how bad they can be, but that's the big selling point for American Idol's hugely popular season opening auditions. And as you know, if you've seen the program, they, they, they mix the very bad and the very good. They show the ones who've been accepted and are going to make it to the next level and the ones who are really bad, but they for some reason think they're good and they get in and it's very entertaining. Very good, very bad. This period of history in the book of 2 Kings, in Israel's history, is similar to that. You have a mix of the very good and the very bad. You've got great kings, not many, but some, and you've got some very bad kings. You've got a lot of those. So it's almost like we have parallel tracks of degeneration and regeneration, of unrighteousness and righteousness. The book, A Tale of Two Cities, begins, it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Two parallel tracks. This is a tale of two kingdoms, not two cities, but two countries. And if you remember from last study, 1 Kings, the, the big event in 1 Kings is the division of the kingdom. It's not a united monarchy with one king reigning over the country. It is split from north to south. Ten tribes in the north, that's the nation of Israel. And then the nation of Judah, the two tribes in the south with Jerusalem as the capital. The big event in 1 Kings is the division of the kingdom. The big event in 2 Kings is the collapse of the kingdom, or the captivity, you might say. There's a couple of different superpowers, and there will be the taking over of these two kingdoms in the north and in the south. So I'm going to give you a division of the book very simply, simply into two slices. Because basically what you have here, and if you've read some of the chapters, you know, there's a lot of lists of names of kings and a couple of prophets. We'll meet them tonight. But you have a list of kings and how long they reigned and something notable about them. And you'll notice that it'll, it'll tell you about who reigns in the north and then who reigns in the south. 
and if they intersect or interact at all. And it just sort of follows that through. But there is a distinct division in 2 Kings. Chapters 1 through 17 is the first division. Chapter 18 through 25 is the second division. That first section, you could call it the struggling kingdoms, plural. The struggling kingdoms. The kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. They're struggling. They're going down and sometimes going up because a prophet will speak to them and there'll be a mild period of repentance and they go back down. They're struggling and sometimes fighting each other. And then you have, in chapter 18 through 25, the surviving kingdom, singular. So the struggling kingdoms and the surviving kingdom, that's Judah. I say it's survived because the kingdom of Israel will go into captivity The kingdom of Judah will survive for a period of about 150 years, but the book ends where it finally collapses as well. So the struggling kingdoms and the surviving kingdom. Something to note about God, and you see it in the the ministry of two notable prophets, and that is God is a pursuing God. He's a merciful God. He loves before he judges To reach out. He loves to give people as many chances as is possible before he ultimately judges them. And it's a theme. It just doesn't happen here, though it's repeated here. You see it repeated as a theme throughout the scriptures. God pronounces a judgment, gives a warning, but before he ultimately judges, it's as if he reaches his hand out and says, Now, let's consider this. You don't have to go in that direction. It can be changed. You could turn around. And that's a theme we see even in the New Testament. One of the most notable examples of that is with a fellow by the name of Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, the one who had prearranged the arrest of Christ even before the Last Supper. That's why I find it interesting that at the Last Supper, Judas was sitting to Jesus' left. And if anybody knows ancient Middle East custom, the honored guest, was at the right hand and at the left hand of the master. And you only get there by invitation. So before the supper, I'm sure Jesus walked up to Judas and says, Judas, I want you sitting right next to me, buddy, right to my left hand. And that's why Jesus said, the one that I give the sop to, and it's, it's typical to pass over to take a piece of the bread and dip it in that bitter herb sauce and pass it to the left, gave it to Judas. It was as if he was reaching out. I know what you're doing. I know what you're about. You don't have to go this direction. And then as he got up, Jesus finally said to him, whatever you do, do it quickly. Well, something to note is that in spite of these kingdoms struggling and the ones surviving, in spite of these kings going from bad to worse, there are two prophets, and their names are similar. Elijah and Elisha. And it's as if God sends them in the midst of a faltering kingdom to defibrillate the heart. That's the only term I can really think of. They're, they're like failing. They're having heart failure. And these prophets come in trying to defib the heart and revive the patient. But it's too late. So you've got some wicked kings, but you've got some great messengers that come And we'll notice them, especially in the first eight chapters. Well, let's begin in chapter 1, and we'll be highlighting a few uh, chapters and verses as we go. This is the struggling kingdoms of Israel in the north and Judah in the south. Now, as we begin in chapter 1, we're beginning with the end of Elijah's ministry and the beginning of Elisha's ministry. How many people get those two prophets confused? Honest show of hands. Yeah, most of us do. The rest of you aren't telling the truth. That's okay. (laughs) We all do because their names sound so similar. And that's because that's what they sound like in English, Elijah and Elisha. In Hebrew, it would be very easy to tell the difference. The first prophet is pronounced Eliau, Eliau. The second one, Elisha. So there's a big difference between that pronunciation, but we're speaking English, so Elijah and Elisha, they sound very, very similar to each other, but they're very different. And we're going to read about that succession tonight. 
Go down to verse 8 of chapter 1 as we see a description of Elijah the prophet. By the way, um, the chapter opens up with Ahaziah. Now, you're going to have a lot of names tonight. I don't care if you remember them, but you'll remember the two kingdoms. Ahaziah is the king in the north. Jehoram is the king in the south as the book opens. And Elisha and Elisha will interact with him. Verse 8, chapter 1, describes Elijah. Notice he's called a hairy man wearing a leather belt around his waist. Sounds like Bigfoot. (laughs) And he said, it is Elijah the Tishbite. Now go to chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Verse 9 of chapter 2. And so it was when they crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask, what may I do for you before I am taken away from you? Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. What does that mean, a double portion? Simply this. I want to be your successor. I want that same spirit of God that is operating so powerfully in your life that allows you to not operate in your own strength, but see God's continual power. I want that. I want to continue where you are. Leave off. I want to pick up where you leave off. The idea of a double portion comes from the laws of inheritance. You may remember way back in the Torah, in the first five books of Moses, that the firstborn son got a double portion of dad's inheritance. That was his right as he was going to become the successor in that family as leader. So that's the idea of it. Not, I want twice as much as you have. That's not the idea. The idea is I want to succeed where you leave off. So verse 10, he said, you've asked a hard thing. That's an interesting thing to say. Hey, I want to operate by the same spirit and power that you do. I want the double portion. I want that law of inheritance. For, you've asked a hard thing. Why would he say that? Because, frankly, it's hard to be a prophet. You read about their stories. You read about their lives. Being a spokesperson for the Lord to a nation to a group of people is difficult. And I would even say this sentence to anyone who says, I want to be in the ministry. I want to be a pastor. I would say, what you ask is a hard thing. It's not easy to do that. But notice what he says after that. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not, it shall not be so. Then it happened as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. It's wild, I'll admit it. It's better than American Idol. It's wild. He's he's taken up into heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah does not die. He's taken up into heaven. This makes him an an exception to the rule where it says it is appointed unto every man once to die. And after this, the judgment. This guy doesn't die. Now, I believe that he ultimately will die. Now, Now, just follow me for a second. This is the time to really pay attention. See, it's my personal belief that just like the long-standing Jewish tradition that Elijah will come, that Elijah will come. As it says in the last chapter of the Old Testament, chapter 4 of Malachi, that God will send Elijah the prophet before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. That's that final epic period of judgment in the tribulation period. And he will turn the hearts of the children to the fathers and the fathers to the children. I believe that it's very possible that we see in the book of Revelation, Elijah mentioned. Now I'm going to read this section to you really briefly. It's Revelation chapter 11. It concerns the two witnesses that come in the tribulation period. And listen to their description. Revelation 11. If anyone wants to harm them, fire proceeds from their mouth 
and devours their enemies. You've heard of bad breath? This is deadly breath. And if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this manner. They have power to shut heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy, which incidentally is three and a half years. And they have power over waters to turn them to blood and to strike the earth with all plagues as often as they desire. And the text goes down in Revelation and says, When they had finished their testimony, the beast that rises up out of the bottomless pit will make war against them, overcome them, and kill them. The question is always, well, who are these two strange witnesses? It's my belief, it's very possible, that it's none other than the prophet Elijah and Moses, the lawgiver, who return as a testimony, would be the greatest testimony to the Jewish nation, Moses, the great lawgiver, and then the greatest of all prophets to the Jewish nation is Elijah, and be those final bright light before the final day of judgment at Armageddon occurs. Now, I, I make that statement based on a few clues. Number one is the past. If you think back in your Old Testament to some of the things that Moses and Elijah did, it's very similar, isn't it? For instance, Elijah brings fire down from heaven, 1 Kings chapter 18, to consume the sacrifices. We mentioned that last week. Also, in 2 Kings chapter 1, uh, when the king demands that Elijah be brought before him, he sends 50 men to go get Elijah. And they look up to him. He's sitting up on a hill and they say, you, men of God, come down here. The king wants to see you. And Elijah says, well, if I am a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and wipe you guys out. File, fire falls from heaven, they all die. 50 of them, 51 of them. Another group is dispatched. Same thing happens. A third group comes and the the leader of the third group finally says, please spare our lives, please, please come down and talk to the king. And so he does, but fire falls down from heaven. And then also remember back in the Old Testament, Moses turned the Nile River into blood and brought all sorts of plagues, a similar description as we see in Revelation 11. So first clue is the past. Second is that prophecy that I mentioned in Malachi chapter 4. Elijah will come. And even Jesus, who said John the Baptist is a partial fulfillment, turned to his disciples and said, you know what? Elijah will, future tense, still come. And even to this day, at Passover, the Jews leave the door open and a chair at the Passover table for Elijah, just in case he would happen to show up at their Passover. A third clue is precedence, New Testament precedence. For them to come again is already established in two of the Gospels. When Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, two persons were transfigured with him, and they were Moses and Elijah. That's found in Matthew 17 and Mark chapter 19. Moses and Elijah appear with Christ, and they're speaking about the kingdom. And then finally, their passing is a clue. Their passing, the way they died. As I said, Elijah didn't die. He was taken up into heaven as we read in a whirlwind. Moses died, and the Bible says in Deuteronomy, God buried him, and nobody knows where his body was. Now, we get to the New Testament. We read a very strange passage in the book of Jude, verse 9, that says, Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses. It's an odd scripture. We have insight into the fact that you have an, an angel of God and Satan fighting over a dead corpse. You know, I, I would look at that and go, what's the point of this argument? Unless, of course... God wanted to use the body of Moses for some future purpose, i.e., res resurrection, bringing him back as a testimony with Elijah in the tribulation period to speak to the people of Israel, and 144,000 of them will be saved. Interesting thought, is it not? Well, Elisha, the second dude, the guy that asked for the double portion, not only did he do lots of miracles that are recorded here, and we'll only touch on a couple, 
but he also confronts the kings of Israel and Judah. And in chapter 3, he confronts King Jehoram down in Judah. But I'm taking you to chapter 4 now. In chapter 4, we have a couple little highlighted stories, a couple little cameos of the prophet Elijah, uh, Elisha. I better really say that correctly tonight. Elisha. A couple of little stories about some of the miracles he worked. One is with a poor widow, and the other is with a Shunammite woman. Now, I'll explain those terms in a minute. But here's the deal. The chapter opens up with a widow. Her husband died. Um, The creditors want money. She's left destitute. Finally, the creditors come and threaten to take her sons and sell them into slavery. Enters now the prophet Elisha, who says, I'll tell you what you do. Go get a container of oil. Bring it into your house. Get as many empty containers that you can from all your neighbors, any, any that you have, bring them inside the house, close the door, and take whatever little oil you have and start pouring it. And she poured it, and it filled up miraculously all of the jugs of oil or the empty vessels that she had. And then Elisha the prophet said, now sell them, and you'll be able to live off that income and pay off your creditors. That miracle is mentioned. Now, also in that chapter is the story about a couple living up in Shunem, the Shunemite woman. There was a husband and wife up in a little village up north. The little village is called Shunem, up in the, up in the um, uh, northern coast of Galilee. And it seems that they saw Elisha the prophet traveling a lot. And so woman said to her husband, you know what we ought to do, honey, is prepare like a little guest room for this guy. You know, when he's in town, he can stay in the, in the guest bed and we can uh, give him food, etc. Let's just take care of this prophet. So they outfitted this little room and Elisha stayed there whenever he was in Shunem in town. And sort of as a reward, he prophesied that this couple who didn't have a child would within a year's time have a baby boy and miraculously that occurred. A boy was born. The boy started growing up. But one day, out in the field, the boy grew faint, grabbed his head. He had some kind of a splitting headache. We don't know if it was sunstroke or whatever. And he fell over, presumed dead. And she's so upset. The child that God gave her is now dead. And she searches now for the prophet Elisha. So chapter 4, verse 27, they didn't find Elisha, but they found his servant. Now, when she came to the man of God at the hill, she caught him by the feet. But Gehazi, that's the servant's name, came near to push her away. The man of God said, let her alone, for her soul is in deep distress. And get this, and the Lord has hidden it from me, and he hasn't told me. So here's the prophet Elisha saying, you know, this woman is really troubled And for some reason, God hasn't told me what's troubling her. Now, the reason I'm stopping there and having you notice that is, can you imagine being so in tune with God that you're surprised when he doesn't reveal something to you that's going on in a person's life? It's shocking, Elisha. I I should know about this. This should be on my radar screen. God hasn't revealed it to me. Well, it is revealed by the woman, and Elisha comes and spreads himself over, breathes in the child, and the child comes back to life. And chapter 5 is a great story about Naaman, who was a commander for the Syrian army, a field commander, who, though he was a powerful man, had a dread disease in that time, some kind of a skin outbreak, uh, all under the category of leprosy. He was a leper. He didn't know what to do. He had in his household a slave girl, an Israeli slave girl, who knew about Elisha and said, oh, if only, if only my master could get a hold of Elisha the prophet. He's living in Samaria. I know that my master could be healed. Well, Naaman hears about that and goes down to meet Elisha the prophet. So chapter 5, verse 9, Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. Picture the scene. He's a dignitary. He's come not only on his steed, but he's got a lot of people with him, no doubt. He's a field commander. 
And it's typically customary that if some dignitary shows up, you go out to greet him. It's common protocol. It seems that Elisha the prophet didn't follow common protocol. He didn't care about any dignitary. He's a servant of God, after all. Why should he pander to some human dignitary? So verse 10, Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. So Elisha doesn't come out and say, Well, good to meet you. I heard so much about you. You're such a wonderful. He just said to his messenger, Just go tell him, You want to fix this? Go dunk in the Jordan seven times and you'll be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. So you got a a commander with an expectation of a man of God. I expect him to come out and do this. He didn't do it. He didn't fulfill his expectation. And he goes on. Are not the Abana and the Farpar, these are two rivers up north where he's at, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. The Jordan River is like the Rio Grande on a bad day. Okay? The Rio Grande has some beautiful spots, but you know there's some places where it's really narrow and and muddy. And the Jordan River, up around where they were, was just this muddy little stream. It wasn't like the mighty Mississippi or even these rivers mentioned here. It's like a little puddle. And and it's really brown and muddy. And so we imagine this great commander shows up and Elisha doesn't even come out. Just says, hey, listen, go give him a message. Go tell him to dunk in that dirty, muddy river seven times and he'll be fixed. He gets angry. It's like, you want me to just go in the water? I I could have done that up at home. This is ridiculous. Elisha the prophet, through God's power, is going to have this man healed. But it brings up a very interesting, and I say an important principle. Um, God's people do come with expectations of some things to happen or uh, men or women of God, leaders to perform certain ways and they can be disappointed when those expectations aren't met. For instance, and this is just an example, somebody will come into a counseling office and say, we're having problems in our marriage. And if it's a good counselor, he will quickly assess the situation and give biblical principles on how that couple can change their relationship and hence fix the problem. Some people don't want the problem fixed as much as they want to be coddled. Just, just understand and pat me on the back. And there's room for that. The Bible even says that. We're, we're to encourage each other. But as it is with Naaman, so it could be said with us. Do you want to be coddled or do you want to be cured here? You want me to come out and wave my hand and make you feel really good? Or do you want this problem fixed? If you want the problem fixed, get in that muddy, crazy little river. And it'll work. And I can just picture Naaman. He goes, okay, he walks in the river and he dunks one time and people are looking at him. Maybe his other men are kind of snickering at him. He goes down once. He got to do it six more times. Comes up, he's all wet. This is ridiculous. Goes down again, comes up. He's still wet, mud hanging off all over him. But on that seventh time, he came up and he was healed. It was miraculous. No, he didn't get the personal attention that he wanted the prophet to give him, but he was cured. The problem went away. Now, chapter 6 through 8, there are more miracles of Elisha as God is providing a witness to the nation. I'm taking you now to chapter 8, verse 16. And I'm I'm purposely taking you to certain sections because in the Bible from 30,000 feet, I want you to not only get the overall picture, I want you to see how the New Testament and the Old Testament intertwine. Chapter 8, verse 16 gives us insight into the covenant that God makes. Now in the fifth year of Joram, the son of Ahab, the king of Israel, Jehoshaphat, having been king of Judah, Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, began to reign as king of Judah. 
He, that is Jehoram, was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. Now, he served at first as, let's call him co-king, co-regent with his father Jehoshaphat. Then his dad died, and he continued the reign without him alone. Verse 18, he walked in the ways of the kings of Israel, just as the house of Ahab had done. For the daughter of Ahab was his wife, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. Yet the Lord would not destroy Judah for the sake of his servant David, as he promised him to give a lamp to him and his sons forever. Jehoram happened to be the king that introduces Baal worship into the southern kingdom. Okay, just like Ahab, his father-in-law, introduced Baal worship with Jezebel into the northern kingdom. Jehoram introduces this idolatrous pagan worship into Jerusalem and all of Judah. Now, remember back in the Old Testament book of Genesis. God promised that the tribe of Judah would be kept and preserved because the Messiah would come through the tribe of Judah. Genesis 49, the scepter will not depart from Judah nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And we told you that that's a messianic prophecy. Judah would be protected. Okay? Now, with that in mind, get ready for some spiritual warfare here. Because the narrative goes on and we have more kings that are displayed and mentioned here in the north and in the south. More intrigue, more warfare. But watch this. Go to chapter 11. I'm having you skip ahead now. Pass some of the names, pass some of the intrigue to a very key verse. Chapter 11, verse 1. When Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the royal heirs. Everyone who could succeed from the house of David in the tribe of Judah and become the king, destroying all of the royal heirs, wiping out the bloodline. But Jehoshaphat, the daughter of King Joram, the sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, stole him away from among the king's sons who were being murdered, and they hid him and his nurse in the bedroom from Athaliah so that he was not killed. So everybody was killed except one. So he was hidden with her in the house of the Lord for six years while Athaliah reigned over the land. Now, eventually, this guy will become the king of Judah. But think about it. This is, from a human perspective, a close call for salvation history. It's a close call. It reveals a very intense spiritual battle that is happening. Now, humanly, on the human level... The lineage of King David, the royal heirs, were almost wiped out. You know what that means spiritually, messianically. It could hinder, indeed it would hinder, the Messiah's coming. What if all of them were destroyed? And yet the prophecies say that someone from the seed of David will become the savior of the world. If you don't have a a royal seed any longer, if they're all destroyed, God's promises will be thwarted. Okay. Back in the Garden of Eden, after Adam and Eve fell, Satan, the serpent, deceived our first parents, and they fell, they sinned. And and so God gave a prediction, right? He said to the serpent, he said this, I will put enmity between you, Satan, and the woman, between your seed and her seed. He, ultimately Jesus Christ, shall bruise or crush your head, And you, Satan, will bruise his heel. The prediction is that eventually some child is going to be born, a he, a male child, who will crush Satan's power, while at the same time the best that Satan will do is bruise Jesus Christ. Jesus died on a cross, but that paid for the sins of the world. Okay, ever since that prediction, it was Satan's counterattack to discover who the royal seed is going to be so he could destroy him. Now this answers a lot of questions for us. 
For instance, uh, Cain killing Abel. Why? Because Abel was the righteous seed of Adam and Eve. So Satan inspired Cain to kill Abel, so that seed was removed. So God raised up Seth, and the line continued through Seth. And then second, Satan created such havoc on earth that the whole world was judged by God in the flood. God destroyed the entire world except for one family. And that was Noah and his seed. And the lineage continued. Here's a third point. Satan motivated Esau to destroy Jacob, the son of promise, Isaac's promised son. Here's another example. Pharaoh came up with a bright idea. Hey, let's kill all of the male Hebrew children. When Hebrews have their babies, if it's a male, kill it, throw it in the river. If it's a girl, let it live. What was that all about? It was Satan's attempt to destroy all of the seed of the Jews so that the Messiah would be hindered from coming. We go on in history and we find that Saul tried to destroy David. First and second Samuel record several instances of that to destroy the messianic line. Another one is Haman. Remember the book of Esther? Haman puts out this weird edict to destroy all of the Jews in the land, a mass genocide. Again, attempt to destroy the royal seed. Now Athaliah, this crazy woman, says, let's take the entire royal household and kill them all. Why? Because she wants to be in charge and have no competition. But she's inspired by Satan so that God's promises couldn't be fulfilled. Now you follow that all the way through the Bible. You come to the New Testament. You have Herod the Great saying all of the male children in Bethlehem should be killed. An attempt again to kill Jesus Christ. Jesus, Luke chapter 4, goes into the synagogue, says, I'm the fulfillment of the scripture. They take him out to a brow of the hill upon which the city was built, try to throw him over. He escapes from their midst. The temptation of Jesus Christ. Satan takes Jesus to the pinnacle of the temple. Hey, jump! Jump! If you're really the son of God, God will send his angels to protect you. All of these suggestions and attempts is a Definite counterattack to destroy God's promised Messiah. Now, when you put it in that frame, it puts a whole different view on anti Semitism. It gives it a whole different complexion. It's satanically inspired. Now, here's the premise What if God's promise of redemption required the existence of a nation? and the continuance of that nation. That would mean then, if I could destroy that nation, I being Satan, I hate to personify it that way, but if Satan could destroy that nation, he will have thwarted God's plan. That's a heavy statement. But that's exactly what we see in the scripture, and it is all summarized in Revelation chapter 12. You can chase that down on your own later on. So here is one of those examples where there's the attempt to destroy the royal seed. It doesn't happen. One of them is kept, becomes the next king, and the lineage continues. Chapter 12, verse 1, Joash in the seventh year of Jehu. Jehoash became king, and he reigned 40 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. Strange names, I'll admit that. Jehoash did what was right in the sight of the Lord in the days in which Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. So, a priest becomes a mentor to a political figure. I love that. And because of this man's mentoring and influence, you now have a godly king, one of the few, living by the book, living according to the Spirit of God, a politician with a spiritual heart. However, verse 3, but the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrifice and burn incense on the high places. As long as Jehoiada the priest was alive, the king did okay. As soon as Jehoiada the priest, his spiritual mentor, died, his spiritual life fell apart. Now, I'm going to read you a scripture you may want to write in the margin of your Bible or on your notepad. 2 Chronicles chapter 24 Verse 17 gives us the rest of the story. Now, after the death of Jehoiada, 
The leaders of Judah came and bowed down to the king, and the king listened to them. Therefore, they left the house of the Lord God, their fathers, and served wooden images and idols, and wrath came upon Judah and Jerusalem because of their trespass. Yet he sent prophets to them to bring them back to the Lord, and they testified against them, but they would not listen. It's interesting and it's sobering. And here's the lesson. If your faith in God needs to be propped up by other people, what happens when those props are taken away? If your trust is in people to keep you and target, and don't get me wrong, we all need encouragement, we all need instruction, we all need example. But if you're relying upon people rather than the relationship with God, if those props are taken away, your spiritual life could collapse. That's why we all need our own relationship, our own time, our own interaction with God so that we can help others along. Now look at chapter 14, 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, the son of Joash, the king of Judah, Jeroboam, the son of Joash, the king of Israel, became king in Samaria and reigned 41 years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not depart from all the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel sin. So we have two different Jeroboams mentioned. He restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to, watch this, the word of the Lord God of Israel, which he had spoken through his servant, who? Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who was from Gath Hefer. So I'm showing you here, Jonah is mentioned in the Old Testament apart from the book of Jonah. When you mention Jonah, people think, of course, of the story of the great fish and being swallowed and going to Nineveh and, and, and that story, and that was true. But what Second King shows us is that this prophet had a ministry of revival and preaching to the northern kingdom. He was a prophet used by God even before he was sent to Nineveh from Israel. And he was ministering in that, in that quadrant of the land. I'm bringing this up for a couple of reasons. Number one, some people have a tough time with the whole idea of the existence of Jonah the prophet. They say, he, he, it's probably a myth. It probably didn't happen. It's probably some Old Testament myth, just like you have Greek myths. This is an old Hebrew myth about a big fish that swallowed a dude. It's just not true. It's, it's a myth. Others say that it's probably an allegory. It's a great story, but it's simply an allegory where the great fish in the story of Jonah represents Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, and Jonah represents the people of Israel, and Nebuchadnezzar was going to come in and swallow the people of Israel and destroy them. Or some will say, probably what happened is there was a guy named Jonah. He went on a boat, and he had a wild dream, and he was dreaming that this great fish came and swallowed him. So it's either a myth, an allegory, or a dream. Here we know that the prophet Jonah existed historically. He was a historical figure. He really lived. But apart from that, we have the words of Jesus Christ, who, looking back to the Old Testament, said, as Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. So he is staking his death burial and resurrection on a historical Jonah who lived and went through all those things. Now we find out that he was a prophet in Israel even before the whole incident with the great fish. By the way, notice where he's from. It says Gath Hefer. That's Galilee. And I bring that up with a little smile because if you remember in the New Testament, when Jesus was introduced to some of the Pharisees and scribes, and uh, they said, this is Jesus of Nazareth. And they said, Galilee? He said, no prophet has arisen from Galilee. Now, these were Bible scholars who apparently had forgotten all about this text. 
if they had just done their research and boned up a little bit on their Old Testament, they would have remembered that Jonah was from Gath Heifer, a region in Galilee. And so was Jesus from Galilee, their Messiah. Now chapter 15 is a story about King Uzziah. Some of you will remember that name, King Uzziah. He's called here Azariah. Now here's this word, it'll throw you a little bit. Sometimes there's two different names for the same dude. So you get a little confused. Azariah is mentioned here, but he's called Uzziah uh, in some of the rest of the chapters here and in other places. Verse 1, chapter 15. In the 27th year of Jeroboam, the king of Israel, Azariah, the son of Amaziah, king of Judah, became king. He was 16 years old when he became king. Is that frightening? What if a president or a candidate was running who was 16 years of age. Would you vote for him? Well, this guy was in the succession of kings. He became king at 16, and he reigned for 52 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Jechaliah of Jerusalem. Now, before you say, those poor people to have such a young king, he was one of their best kings. He reigned 52 years. He brought spiritual reform. He expanded their borders etc. Verse 3 tells you a secret. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father Amaziah had done. He's one of the great kings of Judah. There weren't many, but he's one of them. In fact, in Isaiah chapter 6, chapter begins, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. See, when King Uzziah died after a 52-year reign, it so shook the people of Israel that they were wondering, now what are we going to do? We had a great leader. He's gone. And God had to remind even the prophet Isaiah, I'm still on the throne. I haven't left. I'm still in control. Even though your king has left you, I, the Lord God, am sitting on that throne. I haven't vacated it. I'm fully in charge. So he did what was right, except, verse 4, tells you some of his failures, his flaws, except the high places were not removed. The people still sacrificed and burned incense on the high places. Then the Lord struck the king so that he was a leper until the day of his death, and he dwelt in an isolated house. And Jotham the king, uh, the king's son, was over the royal house judging the people of the land. So he was good, but he wasn't perfect, and he had some failures. This was his failure. Number one, as he got older, he decided he wanted to be a priest. So he dressed up as a priest one day and went into the very temple itself and started offering incense. That's why God struck him with leprosy. Second thing he did is he went and he showed um, all of the vessels of the house of the Lord to foreign dignitaries who would eventually come in and seize control of the land. So he kind of gave away the spoils, and uh, God's judgment fell upon him. Look at chapter uh, uh, chapter 18. Hezekiah is the king here. Verse 3. Hezekiah did what was right. He's another good king in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke the sacred pillars and cut down the wooden image and broke it in pieces, the bronze serpent that Moses had made, for until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. Folks, this is the danger of relics. Remember back in chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, that bronze serpent that Moses held up in the desert? uh, serpent on a pole, and if they looked to it, they were healed. Evidently, they kept that. They preserved it. And after a while, they superstitiously attached significance to it rather than to the Lord using it. And they started burning incense to it. They venerated it. They made it the big deal. As people do to such things as the Shroud of Turin, Or I remember as a kid seeing a little card and on it a sliver of wood that my dad showed me. And he was insistent that it was a piece of the original cross of Christ. And as the story goes, that they found this 
piece of wood outside of Jerusalem and it was kept in a monastery and the hierarchy of the church sold it off until it ran out. And then they came up with a new miracle, the perpetuation of the cross, that miraculously more wood appeared and more wood appeared. And they sold thousands and thousands of crosses. It was a miraculous perpetuation of the cross. And people would pray to these things. The children of Israel was now superstitiously following a brass serpent. Now, we're about done because I'm going to sum up a couple of things and we're going to cover it back in Chronicles when we go back. But back to chapter 17 for just a second, verse 20. This is the fall of the north. Here's the collapse. Verse 20, the Lord rejected all the descendants of Israel, afflicted them, delivered them into the hands of plunderers until he cast them from his sight. This is 722 B.C. He tore Israel from the house of David, and they made Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, king. Jeroboam drove Israel from following the Lord made them commit a great sin. For the children of Israel walked in all the sins of Jeroboam, which he did, and did not depart from the Lord. Until the Lord removed Israel out of his sight, as he had said by all of his servants, the prophets, so Israel was carried away from their own land to Assyria, as it is to this day. Then the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Hamath, and from here it goes, Sevar Vaim, and placed them in the house, the cities of Samaria, instead of the children of Israel, and they took possession of Samaria and dwelt in its cities. Okay, 722 BC, Syrians come in, take the northern kingdom captive. Here was their style. They took people, they left the poorest of the land, let them remain. They brought in other people from nations they had conquered, and had them intermarry and repopulate the land with foreign people who brought in foreign gods. So here you have the northern country, Israel, already in idolatry, becoming polluted with even more gods and goddesses. This group will become the Samaritans. And this is precisely why in the New Testament, the woman at the well of Samaria says, to Jesus, why are you talking to me, a Samaritan woman? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. By the New Testament time, there was a rival temple in Samaria that rivaled the worship down south in Jerusalem and a huge split. And that split became because of this occurrence in 722 B.C. Well, chapters 18 through 25 is the surviving kingdom of Judah. They last another 150 years. The Assyrian king, Sennacherib, isn't that a weird name? Sennacherib, that conquered the northern kingdom, goes down to conquer Jerusalem. He's unable to do it. They approach twice. In 713 B.C., there they are to conquer Jerusalem, having conquered Judah. Hezekiah the king spreads out a letter before the Lord. Isaiah the prophet comes in. This is found in Isaiah chapter 36 and 37. God answers his prayer. Jerusalem is spared. He comes again in 701 B.C. to conquer the land. And this time, look what happens in chapter 19. Oh, let's look at chapter 18, verse 13. In the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Now he's going to try to take Jerusalem. Okay. I'll cut it short. Hezekiah spreads out this letter that Sennacherib sends him, saying, we're going to destroy you before the Lord. Isaiah says, don't sweat it. God's bigger than that. Now look at chapter 19, verse 35. It came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 180 5,000. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. Okay. Think of this as I say this next statement. Remember in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane when they arrest Jesus and Peter's out there trying to defend Jesus with a sword, cutting ears off? Jesus, put your sword away, Peter. Don't you know that I could call right now on my father and get 12 legions of angels? Okay, if one angel 
can destroy 185,000 Assyrians? Imagine what 12 legions of angels, hundreds of angels could do. All at the disposal of Christ's command. His power. Well, they're destroyed, but a whole new power emerges. I'm going to take you to chapter 25, verse 1 and 2, and we'll close it up. Assyria takes the northern kingdom captive. They collapse. 150 years pass. Judah is spared. They're the surviving kingdom. And kings are listed in the rest of these chapters. But in 605 B.C., a guy named Nebuchadnezzar makes one of three successive attacks against Jerusalem. In the very first attack, he takes captive a whole bunch of choice young men. One of them is named Daniel. And eventually, on the third attack, 586 B.C., Judah will fall to the Babylonians. Chapter 25, verse 1, it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. They built a siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the eleventh year of King Zedekiah. Okay, briefly, let me sum up the whole chapter. After Josiah, good king, dies... His son Jehoahaz is on the throne. He's only there three months. Barely enough time to warm the throne. He's deposed by the Egyptians. They put his brother Eliakim on the throne, changed his name to Jehoiakim. He's there 11 years. Jeremiah the prophet warns Jehoiakim, don't mess with the Babylonians. Whatever Nebuchadnezzar says, do it. He rebels against Nebuchadnezzar. He is deposed by the Babylonians. Jehoiakim is replaced by a guy named Jehoiachin. He's there for three months and ten days. He is deposed and taken captive to Babylon. Zedekiah is placed on the throne. He starts a coup, and eventually the Babylonians come in, kill his sons, and put his eyes out. He's taken captive to Babylon, and the chapter ends. Now, that's the end of the book. What's the difference between these kingdoms? Answer in short, the kings who ruled them. The kingdom was only as good as the king. If you had a good king, God would honor the reforms and the sincerity and the repentance and bring them prosperity. When a bad king would take them further away from the Lord, the judgment came swifter. A kingdom is only as good as a king. Who's your king? Who's ruling in your life? Are you calling the shots? Are you at the wheel? Are you steering your life? Or have you, have you given it over to the Lord, letting him control your life? A kingdom and a person is only as good as the king ruling his life. I mentioned that I was on an airplane and they were boarding us in, um, I don't know if we were in... Um, uh, Orange County today or Phoenix, but I think it was Phoenix. Yeah, we were getting down in Phoenix. They were boarding everybody on. And I heard this lady a couple rows behind me said, you mean this isn't the plane to Hawaii? <laughs> and it's very untypical for someone to get mixed up these days post 9-11 with a ticket, but evidently she was on the wrong plane. And she said, as they announced that the temperature in Albuquerque, not Hawaii, was 31 degrees, she said, you mean this isn't the plane to Hawaii? She had to get on the right plane. Imagine the shock if she's thinking she's going to land in Hawaii to land in 31 degrees. Have you ever ask yourself as you live your life which direction you're going in and is it the proper direction? It's a question everybody ought to ask because like these two kingdoms, Sometimes they went away from the Lord. Sometimes, briefly, they went back to the Lord. God was always trying to reach in and lend a hand. 